Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm sorry that we had a slight delay letting everybody in, but I can see we're getting up towards 100 people attending. Um, so uh, we'll make a start. Um, so welcome to this, the fifth and final talk of the second series of webinars run by the Royal College of Pathologists on uh, aspects of COVID. Um, we've been through therapy, vaccines, testing, and long COVID, and tonight's topic is the pathology of COVID. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, the double act, um, Mike Osborne and Brian Hanley, who gave the talk in the first series on um, pathology. Um, at the end of the talk, we'll have a, a, a competition to see if we can spot any differences between the second talk and their first talk. Mike's talk, was so successful that the college had no alternative but to appoint him as president almost immediately afterwards. Um, so to remind you of the format, um, our speakers will have 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a 15 to 20 minute uh, question and answer session. Um, if you put your questions in the chat, then they're relayed to me and I can pass them on to the speakers in some kind of logical order, hopefully. Uh, and. Uh, if you keep your microphones off and video off, that improves the connectivity. And a reminder that we will be recording this. Um, and so if you want to revisit, it will be on the, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the RST Path website, um, probably early next week. So without further ado, I shall hand over to, I think Mike in the first instance, um, the floor is yours, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, as Will said, we're a double act. Brian is in control of the slides. So um, if you put the first slide up, that'd be brilliant. Um, this is the second part of, the, of a, a talk that we gave uh, initially um, in August time of last year. Uh, we're going to be talking about the histopathological uh, features of covid uh, at post-mortem, and then we're going to talk about some research that we've done on viral tropism that relates to this. Um, so if we can go on to the next slide. So this is a, a diagram, diagram representing the COVID pandemic, and you can see that uh, the sort of darker blue is Europe, which of course we're part of. And you can see that obviously we had the first wave, and then we've, we dot right down, and then we came into the second wave. Uh, we produced some guidance for the Royal College of Pathologists at the beginning of the first wave, and then gradually we went on to uh, produce this as a paper talking about how to safely do an autopsy in COVID. Um, between those two, we actually did a series of 10 autopsies. These were consented hospital autopsies with extremely wide-ranging uh, sampling of tissue directed largely by people who were interested in researching COVID, so specifically focused on some areas that you wouldn't normally take that they felt were useful for COVID. Um, you can see from the third, third sort of picture in there, that's when we gave our first talk um, last year. And then the findings of our cohort of 10 cases were published in the Lancet Microbe um, towards the latter part of last year. And you can read more about the cases and the description of what we found in that. And this, this is based largely on that and some research we have done around those cases. So if we go on to the next slide. So I'm not going to go through all the cases. That's what we did last time. I'm just going to discuss really the major histopathological findings that we found. And the most significant finding and the one that really tied everything together was the finding of diffuse alveolar damage. Um, so diffuse alveolar damage at various phases um, of diffuse alveolar damage we found in every single post-mortem that we did. Every single case of the all 10 had diffuse alveolar damage at different stages of development. And I'll come and talk about that in a few minutes. In addition to that, there were three other very significant findings. The first was thrombosis. And you can see from this uh, picture, this is the lung, the, the large black areas are thrombosis within 
um, the arteries and blood vessels of the lungs. This is a CD61 stain for platelets, which really, really highlights these thrombosis very well. And you can see how widespread it was. And that was a major finding that we found in our post-mortem series and is in keeping with what other series have found throughout the world. The other thing we found was macrophage activation. And at the bottom there, you can see a very good slide of hemophagocytosis. You've got red cells being eaten by uh, phagocytes. And this, this is characteristic really of severe, particularly infection, but can occur in other conditions as well. So this was really just a marker of how severe the cases of COVID we were seeing at post-mortem were. Now, obviously, they, the, the cases that we looked at were people who had got PCR confirmed diagnosis as the cause of death on their death certificate. So these were the, the worst cases of COVID you could see. Um, the other fourth finding that we found was lymphocyte depletion. Um, the slide with the brown on it is a CD20 slide, and the slide without any color on it, essentially apart from some light blue, is a CD3. So you can see how much lymphocyte CD3 depletion there was, and Brian will touch on these areas later on. The most important and fundamental finding that linked everything together, though, was the diffuse alveolar damage. And if we go on to the next slide... So this diffuse alveolar damage is something that has been seen by a lot of other investigators who looked at post-mortems um, throughout the world. And this uh, editorial that we wrote um, really describes, takes those findings from, from the various series around and, and discusses their significance. And I think what's worth highlighting really is that we found diffuse alveolar damage. We found it at different phases. Um, the other people around the world found similar findings and they found acute lung injury really at various stages of development in all the post-mortems and samples that they looked at. And some of these were from live people as well. So they found things like lymphoid aggregates in some, they found edema, they found acute fibrinous and um, organizing pneumonia, this AFOP uh, condition in others. And in others, they found diffuse alveolar damage of various stages and various levels of formation of the hyaline membranes. And really what we felt when we looked at all of this data and what seems to really be the case is that diffuse alveolar damage is the final common pathway of many forms of acute lung injury in COVID-19 infection. Really what the different studies and the different pathologies that are highlighted in the studies show uh, are different snapshots at different times of the condition. And whilst time seems to be a major factor in this, this is obviously altered by the severity of the condition, um, which itself will depend on the extent of the insult, the level and burden of infection. Brian will come and talk about that again in a minute the patient's susceptibility to the infection, that's likely to be related to genetic factors, but also to acquired factors, particularly the comorbidities that have been so well discussed. Things like obesity, hypertension, um, some uh, racial groups at increased risk, all of these sorts of things feed in to alter the susceptibility. And that together with the, the temporal stages alter the pattern of acute lung injury and diffuse alveolar damage you see, which really underpins all the other changes that you see. And the widespread changes that we're seeing in the lung and the diffuse alveolar damage are really, they're, they're based on several common pathways coming together to give severe lung disease. And those common pathways really can involve the virus itself damaging the lung, secondary bacterial, or in some cases, other infections, and systemic effects really manifest through immune dysregulation and increased levels of thrombosis. And the interplay of those which are more significant and so forth, again, lead to these slightly altered patterns, but all of which really are acute lung injury and diffuse alveolar damage. So those are the most significant findings we had that have underpinned the histology. If we go on to the next slide. Now Brian's going to talk about some specific findings that we've got 
involving viral tropism and linking to some of the themes I've just discussed. Thanks, Mike. Um, so as Mike was saying, the last talk focused mainly on the histopathological findings in COVID-19. I'm just going to try and link those back to the presence or absence of the virus in various tissues now. Um, so our attempts to look for the virus began with morphology, um, the looking for viral inclusions, which weren't prominent and we weren't able to find in our series. And although there's some suggestions of this in the literature, this is not a very sensitive or specific finding. So you have to move on to more advanced techniques. So thinking about how the virus gets into the cell, as you can see it on the right, um, the virus enters via the cellular receptor ACE2. It gets put into a vesicle and it replicates the RNA within the virus uh, using proteins, viral proteins, using the cell's own apparatus. Um, then it packages new virions into vesicles and goes back out of the cell via um, exocytosis. Uh, but the point from our perspective is that along these, uh, at these different stages in the disease, you can identify either viral RNA, viral protein, or indeed ultrastructure using electron microscopy. I'll talk about each of these now. Um, so this will probably be the technique you're most familiar with, which is quantitative real-time PCR. And these are data from the series of 10 cases we, we performed. Uh, on the left is uh, PCR against the viral aging, um, which just shows the presence or absence of the virus. On the right is a PCR against a subgenomic region, which is essentially a part of the genome which rearranges itself during replication. So it's indicative of active viral replication. Um, on the bottom, you can see uh, which organ is being tested um, and each different symbol applies to a different patient. Uh, so rather than trying to go through all of this uh, in this slide, I just tried to link this back to uh, the individual patient. So beginning with this 24 year old man, uh, he was diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, had been self-isolating at home and symptoms worsened over seven days. He had a cardiac arrest at home, was brought in by ambulance and died very quickly in ICU. Um, when we look at his viral data, the most prominent finding here really is the extraordinarily large amount of virus in the lung, and uh, much more than any of our other cases. And indeed, he had more virus in many or in other organs as well, um, but the lung was the main finding. Um, and his post-mortem findings were indeed in keeping with this. So we had florid exudative phase diffuse alveolar damage, which is one of the earlier stages of, of diffuse alveolar damage. He had acute kidney injury, uh, hemophagocytosis and evidence of, of cerebral ischemia. So all of this tied together in terms of having a high viral load uh, and having overwhelming lung disease. Uh, then I'll, I'll just present these two patients together, which are a 78 year old man and a 69 year old woman. I present them both together because they had relatively similar clinical histories. They both presented the hospital uh, quite early in their disease had significant comorbidities and neither were transferred to ICU. The man indicated by the uh, green square or diamond uh, died slightly later and the lady uh, represented by the purple triangle present, or died slightly later. Um, but in keeping with their similar clinical presentations, their viral data is also quite similar in that the majority of the virus you can see here in the tongue, trachea, nasal epithelium, lung, don't have quite as much virus as the previous patient, but then again, they died slightly later. Um, most cases, the uh, gentleman had less virus than the, the lady, pro probably in keeping with a later stage in the disease. And then when we looked at the post-mortem findings, the man who died slightly later had exudative and patchy organizing phase, diffuse alveolar damage, uh, but otherwise, the post-mortem findings were pretty similar between the two. Then there's this patient who is a 22-year-old man. And what's striking initially from his PCR data is that he had hardly any virus in the lung at all, or in, in any of the organ systems, except for a small amount of virus in the lung. Uh, so let's look at what his history was. Well, he had been a complicated patient, um, transferred to... Uh, our center um, 
from a, from another in area. Uh, he had COVID-19, a cerebral infarct, multiple pulmonary emboli, rhabdomyolysis, and he died very late in the disease uh, after 22 days in ICU and after 27 days um, since the onset of symptoms. And I don't know if you remember this from our previous talk, but these uh, macroscopic findings are extremely marky, marked. He had um, infarct necrosis of multiple organs, a uh, prominent fibrinous pericarditis. Um, and people say, of course, you see trombi in COVID-19, which you can do. But in our experience, this was by far the most prominent macroscopic findings we saw. And uh, what tied all this together was a diagnosis of disseminated mucormycosis, which you can see here, the patient developed a um, secondary fungal infection, probably had largely cleared the virus, had no evidence of active viral replication and died from the, the secondary infection. So that's how it correlates with clinical history. Uh, Mike has briefly discussed different patterns of diffuse alveolar damage. And on the left, you see what can be termed a pre-exudative phase, which is non-specific. Uh, pulmonary edema, uh, and over time this transitions into an exudative phase characterized by these, the classic highline membranes and some interstitial lymph, uh, lymphocytes. And then uh, as that progresses to more of an organizing scarring phase called uh, organizing phase diffuse alveolar damage, um, which has prominent fibroblastic proliferation, uh, loss of normal lung architecture. And this has been shown in this uh, study um, which I give the reference for, uh, in patients with exudative phase diffuse alveolar damage and COVID-19, they were able to identify the virus using immunohistochemistry. So this is identifying viral proteins. But when they went and tried to identify the virus in patients with the later organizing phase diffuse alveolar damage, they weren't able to identify any virus. So again, this is in keeping with a large viral load earlier in the disease process, which then dips later as the disease goes, goes on just finish off by briefly discussing electron microscopy because particularly early in, in the pandemic there were a lot of uh, pictures in the, the literature of things that people were calling viruses um, and I would uh, say to you would you be able to tell me from these images which one of these is SARS-CoV-2 or the viral cause of coronavirus and the point I'm essentially trying to make is it's a very difficult thing to uh, determine, and in fact, many things look like variants uh, within the within the cell. And for those who guessed right, uh, in the middle is SARS-CoV-2. As you can see on the left is our microvilli and cattler and coated pits, um, which you know look very much like viruses. On the right is a microvesicular body. And indeed, when you go into details about this, um, there's a whole range of components within the the cell, uh, including uh, clattering coated vesicles, endosomal pathways, um, autophagosomes, all sorts of things can look like the virus. And these are all imaged uh, of different things on, on the left and right of the scheme, screen. And in fact, none of these are, are coronavirus. Um, and to add insult to, uh, to injury, the virus uses these pathways to get into the cell. So it can be very complicated um, and indeed, if you're having difficulty in this area, it's probably worth discussing with, with an expert. Um, but for those of you who would like to read more about these pathways, we, we've published some of this work in the Journal of Pathology. Um, so I'll just leave you back to, to Mike just to, to finish us off. Thank you, Brian. So really just to summarize what we've covered, um, <clears throat> the major and consistent histopathological finding in COVID-19 really is diffuse alveolar damage. And, in, and other things you see is thrombosis, macrophage activation, and lymphocyte subset depletion. But those are, those are sort of um, associated things. It's the diffuse alveolar damage that is the fundamental change we've seen in everybody. The, the diffuse alveolar damage you see can be in different phases and is in self, it's fat, in fact, the end stage of, of acute lung injury of various forms and really is a reflection of the, the time scale that the person's been exposed to, 
the severity that they've been exposed to that itself is an interplay of other things, the viral load, their genetic makeup, their comorbidities, and so forth. So that really is the fundamental thing. And just, just to remind everybody, diffuse alveolar damage is not pathognomonic of COVID-19. You can get it in many, many other conditions. Very, you can get it in viral infections. You can get it in inhalational injuries. You can get it in drug reactions and so forth. So it's not specific, but the severity that we saw and the extent that we saw and others have seen is is very bad in COVID-19 compared really with other causes. Um, the pathological features of COVID-19 change over time. And that's what we've talked about. And that really is modified by the person, by the genetic makeup and by their pre-existing conditions and other factors. So that, that the changing over time modifies what you see and you see just a snapshot where, whether you've taken a biopsy or it's a post-mortem case. There's a lot of the, the viral identification Brian talked about, you can correlate that with the severity of the disease. And it seems to be that there is initially a very big viral load and this may drop off over time. And there's also a link, unsurprisingly, between, uh, between the, the, the level of viral load and the severity of illness. Um, and then the clinicopathological correlation is, as always, absolutely essential. And particularly, as was well highlighted, when you're using things like electron microscopy and so forth, because it is, it's been quite easy to overinterpret findings in the COVID-19. And um, so there's got to be taken into account with the clinicopathological correlation to really let you understand what the, what the disease is causing and how it's come to be in that position. So that's a summary of what we found in our post-mortem study. I think we've got some references to finish off with. So thank you very much. Um, that's our talk and we're happy to take any questions that anybody's got. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for that. That's a very, very interesting data that you presented there. Um, the, the striking, well, okay, the first thing is if the key finding in the lungs is this uh, alveolar damage, how, how does that resolve in patients who don't die? Is this the precursor of, of pulmonary fibrosis? That's a, that is a very interesting question. So this, this feeds into a whole area that we've touched upon in some of the other webinars, the long COVID and so forth. So diffuse alveolar damage, as I say, is not limited to COVID. And other causes of diffuse alveolar damage um, can lead to interstitial fibrosis. And again, the people who get interstitial fibrosis is down to modifying factors depending on their genetics, depending on their pre-existing conditions and other variables that mean that obviously some people will get it and some people will get nothing at all. And quite what those are ill-defined to say the least. Um, but there is a large body of thought that says the changes that we have seen in the lungs in, in COVID are similar to changes that we have seen in other conditions that have gone on in some circumstances and in some individuals to lead to interstitial lung disease. So there is likely to be a, at least a cohort of people who develop interstitial type lung disease resultant from COVID. Quite who they are, quite which of the risk factors are, that is difficult to say, but it would seem reasonable to think that the more significant the injury, the more likely you are. And, and, and some of the some things associated with interstitial lung disease, for example, lymphocyte cuffing and lymphocyte infiltration into the interstitium have been reported in cases of COVID. So yeah, there is certainly a, a worry that that is gonna be significant going forward. That, that's very interesting. The, our speaker last week talking about long COVID indicated that the, the respiratory physicians are expecting a an epidemic of interstitial pulmonary fibrosis to follow the epidemic of, uh, of COVID. Um, the, the striking feature about the, the qPCR data to me, and, and I think a lot of the people who are putting questions in, is that you, you appear to find virus in quite high quantities in pretty much every tissue. In fact, there wasn't any tissue there in which you hadn't found it. And although it's a bit difficult to tell, almost in every patient in every tissue, apart from your one young man who, who died of possibly 
something unrelated or, or mucormycosis. Um, so, and, and, I, and especially the, the, apart from the lung, the second highest organ uh, was the heart. So there are a number of questions about what is going on in the heart. Is this simply virus spilling over in the blood or is it actually a, a viral myocarditis? And the, the immunohistochemistry, which I guess is going to tell you that kind of answer, Brian showed one slide of, of a lung stained immunohistochemically. So what's going on in the heart when you stain, or, or, the, or the kidney or the gut when you do immunohistochemistry? Uh, I'll let Brian answer that. Yeah, I mean, where, where to begin? Uh, I suppose the first point to make on the PCR data is that it's, it's a logarithmic scale. So, you know, each point you go up, it's 10 times higher. So the levels in the lung were, you know, much, much higher. Um, so, for example, in the heart and the brain, in some of those cases, they're, you know, thousands of times lower than the, the, the lung. The interesting point, which I, I didn't really have time to discuss here, was that there were two patients who had very high um, levels in the, in the heart, you know, almost as high as, as the lung in, in, two um, in some of the other patients. And totally surprisingly to us, that these were the two patients who had evidence of myocardial damage um, by uh, an histology. So one patient had a acute MI uh, at a right coronary thrombus, and the other patients had a, a mottled myocardium had spent a long time in ICU uh, and had contraction band necrosis on histology. Um, so it, it's quite interesting to think about whether the, the virus actually um, gets into the lung and causes myocarditis. We didn't see any myocarditis in any of our cases. And we're working on, on doing a bigger study on uh, performing immunist chemistry on all of these cases. One of the corollaries to that is that without immunist chemistry, you don't know whether this is the heart tissue involved or if it's just coming from the blood from a significant viremia in these patients. And if you have, you know, mottled myocardium thrombosis, it's arguable you got edema and, and just more blood in, in those hearts. So potentially that's uh, one um, uh, explanation for it. But it, it's something we're working on, um, and we just really want to be sure about the immunistic chemistry before we, we uh, publish those findings. Um, okay, um, because to, I've not heard a lot about cardiological complications of COVID um, in the talks that that I've been chairing. People have talked about uh, gut complications and kidney uh, and brain, but um, I was surprised at the levels of virus in the heart. Um, so there's some fairly specific questions here. Um, uh, Peter Bothmer has noticed there was quite a lot of virus in the brain and he's asking, do they have structural brain changes? So the most prominent changes was uh, microglial activation, but pretty much all patients had glial activation in most of the brain regions um, uh, taken. Um, and this was seen by uh, several neuropathologists. Um, but that's a non-specific finding. I mean, you see it in basically, I think any case that a patient who has severe sepsis. Um, we There was one patient who had a, a midbrain um, uh, encephalitis, um, which was quite curious. And we published those findings elsewhere and whether that had related to, um, you know, respiratory centers and causing uh, respiratory failure from, from that perspective was interesting. But the neuropathologist, Dr. Uh, Saf, uh, or Professor Saf al who was working with us, extensively tried in, in situ hybridization and immunistic chemistry to identify the virus in that tissue and wasn't able to. Um, in the brain, I, I would, again, refer back to it being a logarithmic scale, so it's, you know, several thousand times lower than, than the lung, but, um, it, you know, it, it's certainly interesting. Okay, T two more immunochemistry questions. Uh, there, is, there are many cases that, uh, that we don't uh, turn up a positive PCR, but they're clinically diagnosed as COVID. Have you seen any that uh, immunohistologically you can prove were COVID that were PCR negative? Uh, and the, there's a question here, which antibody has worked best in your laboratory? 
Oh, yeah. I'll start answering that by saying, I think the important thing to realise is there's no really, really, really good immuno at the moment. So there is nothing you can you can do the stain and hang your hat on and go, this is COVID. I don't really care what anybody else says. That's what it is. If the PCR is wrong, the PCR is wrong. This is COVID. We are not at that stage yet. Um, and so that that's a... It, that that is a limitation to what we can do. Um, Brian may have further things to add on this. I mean, there are interesting hypotheses out there about what stays around longer. You know, post mortem, can you identify the viral dark proteins more stable, and you're able to identify them later, or or is indeed RNA more stable? Um, I, I don't think we have answers to those questions. And as you, as Mike has said, I think. PCR is really a more specific test uh, at this point. And, and we don't have an immunist chemical test where we can say this is definitely COVID. So we'd like one though. We'd like one, yeah. True. <laughs> have you have you have you done a postmortem on someone who's been clinically diagnosed as COVID without a positive um, swab in life in whom you found the virus postmortem? We haven't, but well. No, we haven't because we haven't had the opportunity to do the sampling that we would want to, to be able to do that, if you see what I mean. Yeah, okay. Um, somebody's commented they've seen a lot of subplural visceral hemorrhages in COVID positive cases. Is this a common finding seen by others? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you are. That's a common finding in any cause of diffuse alveolar damage. And I think the Lancet paper actually has got a nice picture of Definitely. Okay. And a, a sort of related question is, has retroperitoneal hemorrhage been seen in any PM cases? I know of two patients who've died as a result of this. They were anticoagulated for thromboembolic disease. We, we, it's not something we've, we've seen. Um, that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, particularly if you've got people on um, thrombolytics and so forth, but it, it's, that's not something that we have seen. Okay. If we go back to the lung which I guess is how most patients are presenting. Uh, an interesting question is, have you seen anything pathologically which might explain the, the particular hypoxia these patients have? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And that is, you know, that's something that we've been asked a lot by, and we're a lot asked from the early days by the intensivists. Um, and the answer to that really is no. Uh, we we haven't seen anything that can really explain that. I mean, obviously, there's thrombosis. There's a severe diffuse alveolar damage pattern that's going to, you know, so all the ventilation and so forth is going to be difficult. But why, why um, and apologies to any intensivists or anaesthetists listening, my my knowledge of ventilation is rudimentary, to say the least. But, but as I understand it, these people have a slightly different pattern of the ventilation requirement to other types of diffuse alveolar damage and acute lung injury. And why that is, I am not sure. And why particularly they have a condition where the hypoxia can get so low, but they not necessarily responding to it, which is, well, you know, the, 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 the catchphrase happy hypoxia where people can have PC, PCO2s of sort of 50, 60, but be sitting at home with that because they don't realise that they are as hypoxic as in other conditions. That I do not know what the answer to that is, and we have got nothing. That This is another reason why the neuropathologist was so interested, because they wondered whether there, and there's still a lot of interest to see whether it's a centrally acting issue, um, you know, perhaps at the respiratory centre level and so forth, um, but we, I wish we had an answer to that because that would make a lot of treatment a lot easier. Um, and it's something we have been asked a lot, but it's not something we know the answer to. Okay. Um, what is different about this virus when compared to other respiratory viruses? Why don't we see the severe changes with other respiratory viruses? I suspect one of the, part of the answer is that you do see severe changes sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing to remember is you can get... Uh, well, I mean, to put into perspective, uh, uh, three weeks before the first COVID reported case in this country, I did a post-mortem on a fit young man who 
had died of flu, standard flu. And yes, we did spend a great deal of time making sure it wasn't the first case of COVID and it wasn't. Um, so, you know, we, influenza is a very significant disease in a, in, a, in a proportion of people and you see changes very similar to this. So there are plenty of respiratory viruses that behave in a very similar way. What is unusual about this is it, it, it does produce very significant changes in a large number of people who are infected by it, who require hospitalisation. I mean, it is worth remembering that there are a considerable cohort of people who never even know they've got COVID. Mm. So, you know, it's not so different from other, I'm not making light of COVID, but it's not so different from many of the other respiratory ones. We are... Our cohort is, by its nature, the very severe cases. Um, but that, that's, it, does seem, it is obviously on the severe end of the respiratory virus spectrum. Why that is, I don't know. Brian perhaps has something to add. And, no, but, I mean, potentially tropism related to the ACE2 receptor being in the distal airways and alveoli. I mean, um, if, you, if you're staying up long with ACE2, you immunistochemically lights up the pneumocytes. Um, potentially that's... Yeah. Okay, yeah. So uh, another word, another clue might be in this situation that uh, Sudamva has asked about, have you done uh, post-mortems on heavily immunosuppressed patients who've died of COVID and do you find anything different in the patient who's immunosuppressed? Ryan? Like a transplant recipient. Who's, who's not going to mount the same? I mean, we've done them on diabetic people with type 2 diabetes and, and things like that, uh, which I guess are uh, immunosuppressed, but we haven't done any on um, you know, a transplant patient or a, uh, somebody who's received chemo or something. That you don't know. Oops. Okay. Um, some questions related to the to the process of postmortems. Um, so uh, what was your experience in gaining consent for PM when teams didn't have a relationship with the family? Yeah, Brian was the lead on all the consent, so. I mean, it's a very sensitive issue, and I think you just need to um, just you know, be sensitive around how they, we uh, worked a lot with patient affairs, so I'd go down and talk to the, the um, a lot of administrative staff in patient affairs, and they were very helpful because they, they would know the family even if the team didn't necessarily know them. And some patients might have expressed an interest in a PM or other people might have seemed like they would, you know, have questions that they want to ask. Um, and then basically I, I rang the, the patient's families and discussed it with them. I think, you know, it's, I found it helpful to at the beginning just explain why you're ringing. It is about a postmortem. If people aren't interested, they will, you know, tell you straight away and that's completely understandable. But I was even surprised to find how many people actually were really interested and really engaged and, and you know, wanted to get the PM report and uh, wanted to know what, what we found um, and were in, in some ways almost, you know, grateful to, to be phoned uh, in this way. So, um, you know, it was a learning experience, but we got consent rates about 55%, Fifty-five percent, which is, I think, you know, quite reasonable given that, you know, there's these are unexpected deaths, um, uh, largely. Yeah, um, we did. We did invest quite a lot of time and effort in taking consent. If you see what I mean, so I think it reflects that if if you do hone the technique and spend time doing it, you 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 get higher levels. Okay. Um, some questions that have come to the top of the list because people are giving them the thumbs up. Uh, and I'm not sure what COD means. Is that cause of, cause death? of death? Yeah. yeah. Are CPATH able to advise on COD formulation at PM where a positive swab has occurred uh, less than one month prior to the PM, but the cause of death is most likely non-COVID? Does COVID need to be listed in part two? Well, I mean, I think it's just depend on the cause of death. So, I mean, if somebody has got some patently obvious cause of death that is unrelated to COVID, for example, a traumatic cause of death, then 
that may well be unrelated and everything needs to be taken on a case by case basis. But I would suggest that in most cases where there is a medical condition and the cause of death may not immediately be COVID, obviously COVID, I personally would include it in the part two. So almost certainly I would include it in a part two unless it was so patently, obviously unrelated that I didn't feel it was necessary. Okay. I mean, I, I suspect that's, that, that, you know, we're seeing an awful lot of hospital acquired infection. So you've got patients who are already in hospital with other pathologies and they get COVID and they die. And maybe it's difficult to uh, determine which one it was they died of, their original illness. Yeah, no, I agree. But it's important to remember that the part two is not saying that they died of the COVID. It's saying that it may have contributed to the cause of death. Okay. I mean, there is a similar question, which which six people are uh, thumbs up. Um, are you seeing variation across different sites, Ray COD certification? Um, some places not PMing anyone who's had a positive swab test, but putting COVID down as the cause, while others are doing postmortems, even if there is a positive swab, uh, and finding an unrelated cause of death. I, I yeah, guess that's, I mean, that's absolutely yeah. We we are very aware of that. And those are, you know, issues we've been in discussion with coroners and so forth about. I think the problem, the problem comes back to something that Brian alluded to, is that we, we have not really got any really good post-mortem diagnostic tool for COVID. You can do PCR, but the PCR, is, you know, the, the, is it, it's, it's not as validated as it is in living patients and so forth. There is no... Again, if we had a good immuno test, so you could take, you could do a PM, you could do a biopsy of the lung, and if the immuno was positive, you knew it was COVID, we would be in a different ballpark. It is very difficult. It, in an ideal world, there would be a unified way, a, agreements on the way of giving cause of death. Everything you say is completely true, I, but there is no easy answer to it. Okay, I can see we're getting towards the, um, the time when we have to wrap up. There is a question here. Do you think the coroner system uh, should have a greater role in assessing gathering information in a novel disease? Should we be taking routine histology in coroner's cases to assist in population health? OK, I think that you need to be very, very careful here, because you, what you what you mustn't mustn't mix up is what is a desirable thing for public health and what is allowable under the coroner's rules and act. So do I think that doing, you know, is there an argument to say that sampling histology at post-mortem from all coroner's cases would be useful in terms of public health and surveillance of disease? Yes, there probably is. Do I think that needs to be done? That's, a, that's not a question I can answer because at the moment, you're not necessarily allowed to do it because of the rules and the coroner's acts, which are what facilitate you doing the post-mortem in the first place. So, you know, you've got to work within the consent bounds of consent and the bounds of the law. So those are slightly different questions. Okay. Final question, and it's a very specific one, organ-related. Um, noting the high uh, acute kidney injury rates, do you see any changes in the kidney microscopically or macroscopically? I'll let Brian answer this because there's some, we've got some good answers for this. Good. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, macroscopically, a, a lot of these patients have small kidneys, uh, you know, that in keeping with chronic kidney disease being a risk factor for severe COVID. But in terms of acute changes microscopically, all of the postmortems we've looked at had evidence of acute tubular injury as cause for, um, for their clinical acute kidney injury. And in several patients, we were able to identify thrombi in the kidneys. Uh, and in one patient, um, in fact, we were able to find what are called glomerular microaneurysms and thrombi within capillary loops in keeping with a thrombotic microangiopathy type picture in, in one patient. Um, so certainly the, the most prominent finding is, is acute tubular injury, but there's a a whole range of um, acute kidney injuries that uh, we can define pathologically. Okay, uh, our discussion around the coroner is generating more questions, but I, I think I'm going to have to wrap up. Um, so I knew it would. 
<laughs> I would just like to thank you both again um, for, for a really good overview of the pathology and then um, for dealing so well with the barrage of questions because there really were quite a lot of questions thrown at you there. Um, and that really uh, brings this series of updates to a conclusion. Uh, we just run the five. Um, who knows, maybe in three, six months time, if we're still in the midst of um, COVID and it's dominating our lives, then that will be time to do another update. Um, but uh, up until then, it just remains for me to thank everybody, uh, all the speakers we've had um, over the five weeks, the team at the RC Path, who've done such a fantastic job in organizing this and making it all run so smoothly on the night um, and telling me when I should be wrapping up um, so firmly. Uh, and to thank everybody who's attended. Um, it's generated some really lively debates, some very interesting questions, some very difficult questions. Um, but thank you all for attending. I hope you all stay well. I hope you all get vaccinated and that we're all out and about and can actually see each other face to face in the not too distant future. Um, but for now, it's, uh, it's goodbye from the Royal College webinars. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.